kind of manning some different stations and are going to be passing out a book entitled Take God at His Word. And this is a book that we're going to go through as a congregation, not specifically here on campus, but with your family. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the spiritual discipline of giving and examining what God has to say about stewardship. So we're going to ask that each uh, roommate and every spouse and every family spend some time uh, reading one chapter per week with those that you care about. And we hopefully this will be a, a starter for us and something where we can begin a dialogue. This is not a perfect book, but hopefully we'll get you thinking about some things that we see in Scripture. And hopefully it will start a conversation among uh, different family members and within this church and also hopefully get your family on the same page and most importantly to pass on some of the principles about giving and stewardship to the next generation. So once again, that's going to start uh, coming next week. So we encourage you to read ahead and so we will be hitting chapters 1 next week, 2, and then 3. And if you'd like to, you can finish up with chapter 4 on your own. But the next three weeks we'll be covering them in our time of worship and also within uh, our classes, our ABFs, Adult Bible Fellowships. So please just take one per family and we'll make sure everyone gets one of those. On September 28th, 1991, eight bionauts, as they call themselves, wearing identical red Star Trek-like jumpsuits, waved to the crowd that was gathered and climbed through an airlock chamber into a three-and-a-quarter-acre hermetically sealed greenhouse about 30 miles outside Tucson known as Biosphere 2. How many of you guys remember this? It's kind of wacky science experiment that they did. And the idea was to build this self-sustaining complex and to be isolated for the, from the world for two years without leave, live in, uh, leaving the complex for any reason. And they would uh, spend two years fiving off their own food that was grown, processed, and prepared within the airtight bubble. But unlike space missions, where they would go in and select astronauts based on their training, their experience, and their ability to perform needed tasks, the bionauts were simply self-selected enthusiasts committed to living one another and sharing that same environment and same environmental passions and ideas. Well, many of the plants that were brought in from around the world failed to thrive in their new man-made habitats. And the foliage that did survive was slowed when ants and roaches and crickets ended up killing off the bugs that were necessary for pollination. You can kind of see where this thing is going. And it became problematic. There simply wasn't enough vegetation to produce what? Oxygen. And so these poor bionauts started feeling fatigued and became uh, nauseous and irritable. And then food supplies began to diminish. Further exasperating the problem is they got so hungry that they ate the chickens that were supposed to be producing eggs for them in the mornings. And then they started uh, going and robbing the seed drawer that were necessary to plant additional plants. They started eating the seeds. And so things started coming unraveled. And disputes arose between those living inside the structure and the on-site management team that was on the outside the structure. How heated did it get? They had to bring in U.S. Marshal, U.S. Marshals to post restraining orders for when they came out that they couldn't be so close to this person. After the eight were released... Further controversy ensued when fast food wrappers were reportedly discovered within the self-contained complex. Well, the investors in the program, mainly the Bass Brothers out of, out of Dallas, they hired the Smithsonian Institute to produce a report identifying what went wrong in Biosphere 2. Well, in addition to the ecological problems that we've discussed this morning, they concluded with the following, a lack of a clear purpose and plan among the participants led to an ad hoc mix of scientific initiatives of a variety of quality and methodology which inevitably impeded and tainted the stated goals of the program. Translation, good people doing good things in a haphazard manner that ultimately led to limiting the purpose for coming together in the first place. 
We here at the Twickenham Church of Christ do not want to go down that road. We do not want to make the same mistake not living up to the calling that God has given us as individuals and collectively as a family. So we are in our fourth and final week talking about the purpose and our purpose statement for the Twickenham Church of Christ. Let's all say it together. Making disciples who glorify God by loving Him and loving others. That's what we're trying to do. And it's not just going to be something that we say from time to time. We're hoping it will permeate this community and will permeate the environment here and our budgets and everything else we're doing. We'll have a, a common, unified purpose doing what God is calling us to do as a faith community. Well, up until now, our focus has been primarily on the vertical relationship, our time with God, bringing glory to Him, and, and making disciples who glorify God. And also spending time in talking about how we love God and that relationship that we have. And and our final leg of this is the horizontal relationship of loving others. How do we do that? How do we become the people that God is calling us to to be? Well, I I think if we're going to talk about loving others, we need to kind of warn ourselves that there are two ditches that a lot of of well-meaning folks fall into one or the other. And the first ditch that will inhibit us from truly loving others is spending time with God without serving in the name of God. Well, the the whole idea of the biosphere was to spend $150 million on a self-sufficient bubble. What was the purpose? To meet the needs of those gathered, the like-minded folks on the inside, separate and apart from the world. And I hope we don't succumb to the same way of thinking, viewing church as, as, as almost like a, a Christian bunker that we hunker down in and, and we protect those that we love and those that are like-minded from the ways of the world. Certainly, we're called to be called to be separate and apart from the world, but not disengaged from the world. You know, if we're looking at, at uh, becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, Certainly, we spend time in God's Word and we, we read about His teachings. But if we're following so close that we get the dust of the rabbi, as we talked about in our discipleship process, we, we're not just embracing what Jesus taught about, but also how He interacted with others, the things that He was passionate about, soaking His teachings, but also His commitment to a mission. And Jesus began his ministry, and he wanted to make clear exactly what he hoped to do. And so the, the first time that he kind of, well, we have the whole wedding feast where he turned the water into wine, but the first time that he publicly proclaimed, I'm going out there, and I'm, I'm bringing in this new kingdom. The first time he did that is when he, he preached at his hometown of Nazareth. And when he was asked to, to read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. This is the passage he chose to read. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I'm not just going to be talking about a new way of looking at the law. I'm also going to tell you about the priorities, the things that God has put on my heart. And this is an active thing. It's it's not just an intellectual pursuit that's going to be kind of tweaking what we saw in the law of Moses. We're going to see that God's holy people are going to be called to make a difference in the community around them. And so you're going to see I'm going to be living differently, but I'm going to be connecting in a very purposeful way. And so we're called to put our faith into action just as we see Jesus, the way he says, this is how my ministry is going to be marked. Well, the second ditch that we can kind of fall into is serving in the name of God without spending time with God. There, there's a reason why the greatest command had parts A and part B, because they're, they're, they're connected. And you can't have one without the other. So Mark begins telling of, of the gospel with after Jesus is baptized and, and comes out of his time of temptation. First thing he does is, is he goes and he demonstrates his power over the demonic world by, by driving out a demon. And then it says, the text says, he went and, and healed some that were sick. And he goes to, to Peter's house and, and heals his mother in law. And word gets out on the street and it says, 
all over the, the region of Galilee. They start gathering all those that, that have demons and those that are in, in need of, of healing. And so all throughout the night, we see him just bringing people, bringing people. Finally, they close the doors and people go to sleep. The text tells us Jesus got up early in the morning. He went to go pray. And what he was doing was recalibrating his spirit with his heavenly father. Mark chapter 1 and verse 38 tells that Peter and some of the disciples are saying, they're gathering again. Where where are you going? Everyone's looking for you. It's a great opportunity. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. This is why I have come. It, it, It wasn't just about healing. It wasn't just about driving out demons. I've got a message. And so he is spending time with God to help him frame and recalibrate his ministry from time to time. So as Jesus' time with God informed, it also empowered his ministry to others. And I, I think the same is true for us, that if we're not spending time with God, if, if, if we're not allowing him, as John talked about, to fill our, our hearts and, and to fill our souls to where our ministry flows out, inevitably, it'll start running dry. Believe it or not, it even happens to us ministry types. How do I know when this is happening in my life? Well, I hate to say it, but people start to bug me. Uh, you really don't want to hear that from your preacher, but working with folks in need and sometimes working with people in crisis or, or people that don't know God uh, sometimes is difficult. And if I'm not spending time with God, not connecting with Him, sometimes I forget that the person that I'm trying to spend time with truly is a child of God that God's calling me to minister to because I'm trying to do it out of my own strength. Luke chapter 18 tells the story of the blind man that's sitting outside of Jericho. And there's this huge procession. Everyone knows that Jesus is coming. He's now a celebrity. And so here comes this procession. They're marching to Jericho. And the, the blind guy's there by the side of the road. He's like, what's going on? It's Jesus. Jesus, son of David. And what do they do? shh, hush up. He doesn't want to mess with you. And Jesus stops the procession and says, yes, I do. Bring this man. Son, how how can I connect you? What do you want? And he heals him. So we don't know if it was the officials, uh, you know, maybe the town councilor or the mayor from Jericho that, that hushed this man up, but Jesus corrected it. Matthew 19, it says it was disciples that when a bunch of children came up and jumped on Jesus' lap, they started peeling them off and started rebuking them and trying to shoo them away and rebuke their parents. And Jesus says, really? This is what the kingdom is about. Have y'all gotten so lost and and have lost your focus? Have have I not communicated that unless you become like these children, then you've missed it. Even his disciples were running low the people were starting to bug. Uh, A second thing I see in my life is I get fatigued. Mark chapter 5 tells the story of the woman that had been bleeding for 12 years. And as they're kind of walking through this crowd, she reached out and touched Jesus' cloak. What what happened? Well, it it says that the power was drained from him. He he could feel the power going away. And sometimes, uh, I I just feel like that... you get kind of worn out. And then other times you see people in ministry that go from worn out to being burned out. If God's not filling your vessel, it's hard to offer a cup of cooled water in his name. Amen? God's got to be the one that's given that. Because if it's of our own strength, it, it's not going to work. We'll eventually run dry. And then the final one really bothers me. When I see results from what I'm trying to do or what I can accomplish with my talent, with, with my time, with, with my treasure. That, that's as far as it goes if I'm not spending time with God. And, you know, I, I, I appreciate when people come up and say, well, that, that was a nice lesson. Or I, I appreciate what you did here. And wasn't that nice? And you're, you're so sweet to help out. And, and that, that's flattering. But what I'd much rather hear is God was among us. God was among us. And so I've got to be connecting with God if we're going to do that. And, you know, ministry-wise, I want us to bite off more than we can chew. I, I want us to be strained with resources. I, I, I want us to, 
for God to lead us into areas that we can't manage, that we can't control, that we can't fund, or, or even envision how it's going to play out. Because I, I want it to be something that's so big that God says, and everyone else says, that's a God thing. It's not what we've been able to accomplish with our talents. And I, I want us to get in over our heads. I know that sounds bad, but if God is going to open the door for us, and it's of Him, He's going to provide. He always does. Money's going to be there. I, I want us, whatever we put our hand to, to be a God thing and not of me or of anyone else on leadership within this congregation. I want people to point to God based on what's happening within this family. I'm going to invite a friend of mine, David Isham, to come up and talk with us a little bit because one of those things that God's fingerprints have been all over is our work in Ecuador. So David, I'm, I'm going to let you sit here and I'm going to sit over here at the side and just talk for a moment. David, I, I can't believe it, but uh, I met you and your wife, Karen, almost 30 years ago. Can you believe that? You're getting we're old. Getting, we're getting old, that's right. Yeah. I'm a little bit ahead of you. Okay. But uh, David and, and his wife are, are with the Decatur Church of Christ. And yes, it is a conspiracy since we have Beverly Ross, who did a fantastic job blessing us last week. Amen. It was just wonderful to have her here. Uh, and she sent, us, uh, uh, sent me a text this morning saying that she's praying for our time together. And I said, well, you need to send Rick next week, her husband. So he's the, the preacher there. But uh, David, one of the things that's really exciting is you hear about friends that kind of fall away. But it's exciting to see how God has continued to work with you and Karen over the years. And God's plugging you in to expanding his kingdom. Just share a little bit because your church has kind of started partnering with our work down in Ecuador. And so we, we have some, some people in this congregation that were here you know, a decade ago when this work began, but others that have been here a few weeks or a few years and, and really need to hear the story. But kind of share just a little bit about how you got involved in this and maybe also compare it with the work that you guys were doing down in Brazil and kind of just... What makes you excited about the Hacienda? Um, well, first of all, let me just say that, based on what you're saying just a second ago, there's a God thing happening in Ecuador, no doubt. Um, the Decatur Church, uh, we have been so blessed uh, to have gotten involved in this work in Ecuador, and it's because of one of y'all's past members, Jason Brooks. Jason and Valley Brooks moved to Decatur. And Jason actually works for me, and he brought uh, Justin Snyder to our mission committee uh, one Sunday afternoon dur during our meeting. And um, I've been on the mission committee for a dozen years or so, and, and I have uh, never been so instantly convicted that God's hand is on a mission work. Um, what is going on down there on that mountainside, um, you know, right outside of Quito, is uh is to me just amazing and i don't know how to say this how many of y'all have been down to hacienda of hope raise your hands okay that's not nearly enough of y'all okay there's a lot of y'all that have been but i'm telling you you need to figure out how to get down there to the hacienda because um i don't think this church realizes the effect that it's having on a country directly and indirectly and and that's really the, the two of the main points I want to make today you guys I mean there are uh, um, there are 20 orphans down there whose lives have been physically saved who uh, are developed developing a love for Christ and who uh, if they've not already been will will you know uh, accept Jesus and and be uh, and have eternal life. So it's but, really changing the course of their life dramatically. Dramatically. Uh, there's 20 orphans. There's 160 kids in a private school from that mountainside that are getting a Christian education. There are 75, 80 kids a day that are getting bussed up the mountain for an after-school program that are having, uh, they get hot baths and they don't have running water where they live. I mean, they're getting de-liced. They're getting fed. They're getting taught. They're getting helped with their their lessons, they're, they're getting loved on. I mean, so it's like every day there's 250 kids and 30 staff members that are just, that are, uh, 
just being changed. And, and I just firmly believe that, that what's happening there will change the face of Ecuador. I, I believe that someday a, uh, a little mayor of Abacundo may come from the Hacienda of Hope or a governor or a senator or maybe a president of Ecuador. Amen. Um, you know, how many of you that have been down there know Christian? He's one of the oldest orphans down there. I mean, Christian is to me what, what an amazing example who has three brothers and sisters who he was feeding out of the jungle and stealing, you know, when he was 10, 11, 12 years old to take care of his little kids. And, and now he has been in that orphanage um, for seven or eight years now. He's 19 years old. And when I was down there this last summer, now Christian, he, he is the first product of Hacienda of Hope. Christian dreams of becoming a missionary. He wants to get involved in the Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas. And I asked him, I said, well, where do you want to go be a missionary? And, and he, he says he wants to go to Africa. And, and so this is a, an orphan that was living in the jungle, uh, taking care of his kids. And that is, the, that is just the perfect example. I mean, your first thing is making disciples. And uh, that Christian, he is down there um, ready to go into the world now and do his own job of making disciples. Um, you know, so, so many of you, you see the pictures and you know what's happening directly down there, but, but I want you to understand what happens indirectly also. And uh, my best example of that is just what's happened at Decatur Church of Christ. You know, our, uh, you know we used to be a church that had a $1,000 a month mission budget, and that's what I started with on that committee a dozen years ago or so. And, you know, and, and we did our little deal, and we'd farm out a little money here and a little money there, and and uh, honestly, since we've gotten involved at the Hacienda of Hope, and we've started sending uh, folks down there to, to work and to serve in youth groups and stuff, uh, that work has just infected the Decatur Church of Christ. Uh, and it just infected us from a, uh, a desire to, to participate and serve in, in the mission field. And so uh, from, you know, we've seen... Uh, both financially and through service. I mean, we, we decided to have our first Mission Sunday, and we had a $25,000 goal, and that was about, oh, three, four years ago. And at, we, at the time, that was stretching. Yeah, we'd never, had a, we'd never had a Mission Sunday contribution, and so we thought, wow, what could happen? And, you know, and that would have been about triple what our Sunday morning regular, you know, contribution would have been. And we, uh, we raised almost $50,000 that day, and we were just blown away. And, and the, the next year, then we decided to have a, uh, uh, we'd, actually, we had raised $67,000. And so the next year, we thought, well, we can't ask for less, so we'll go seventy five you know. And uh, sure enough, um, $140-something thousand dollars was raised at the next one. And so then this last year, we were like, well, um, you know, man, how do you, there's no way we could get $150,000 again. And, you know, I don't consider the Decatur Church a wealthy church or, or anything. And, and uh, I remember one of the, the, the sons of one of the other mission committees, he, he was just like, well, why don't you make it, you know, $200,000? And we're just like, oh, well, there's just no way our church could give $200,000. And, and uh, so we thought, well, one, it was like 160 something was what the previous year had been. So we'll, we'll make it 175. And uh, this last October, we, uh, there was like 200, just under $230,000 was contributed at our Mission Sunday. And, and I know that's just, that's money, and it's just checking up in a plate and stuff, but, but it goes so much further than that, because now we have, um, we have uh, restaurant equipment service technicians. They, they, I have a, there's a man on a plane right now going down there to help Jerry work on the, the, the big walk-in food locker that he's trying to build. We have an intern from the Decatur area down there for a whole year. We've had plumbers go down there and work on the house, electricians. We've had uh, various people go down there. We built a bridge last summer. Um, but my daughter was an intern down there last, last summer at Camp Bellevue, uh, helping with the after-school program. But it, it, it just has exponentially just affected so many people in our church. And now a young lady who went down there with our youth group, now she's seriously committing. She goes to school at Harding and is seriously committing to a three-year work in the mission field in Africa. We have a, a young Hispanic girl from the Decatur Church who went 
uh, last summer on the youth group thing, and she has just recently become a Christian, and now uh, this next summer, she's going to intern at the Hacienda of Hope. So it, it has just infected us. Now, David, you're uh, a businessman, and so you evaluate things all the time, and I know that y'all have done work in other places and uh, through mission trips and other things, you've been exposed to a lot of things. What is so different that has got you excited saying, this is the place we need to put our money? I, I think it's because the, the work is there to, to serve people. And, and, and it, it's not just about going and uh, opening a little storefront and saying you're going to have a, a school of the Bible and just inviting people in or just have a gospel meeting and trying to convict adults that they're that they're sinners and that they need Christ. And there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. But, but of all the works that we've been involved in, I've never just looked at something and just saw how, how much effect it has. But when you take and, and you go take care of God's children on earth and you, you take those kids, and, and these, are, these are little kids that are in poverty, and, and you feed them and you love them and you teach them about Jesus, and, and they're learning the English language, and that is just their ticket out. Speaking English in Ecuador is just their ticket out of poverty. Um, but, but that model that's happening down there of, uh, of raising up those children of Ecuador to love God, and, you know, uh, out of the 250 a day that it touches, you know that each year a group of those leave and graduate from that program and another group comes on. But you guys, it, it's, it's only just begun. The synergy has only just begun. And, and uh, you know, over the next 10 years and 20 years and 30 years, just exponentially, I think, of how that country will be affected. And that, that's what we see that is, that is so exciting is that that model, how it works. My dad was involved with a, a work in Cuenca, Ecuador for all of his adult life and as a supporter of a missionary down there. And, and when I got to telling him about the Hacienda of Hope and what was going on down there, he just, he just started shaking his head. And he said, that's what I've been trying to tell him. I've been trying to tell him for years and years that you just go start with the kids, go take care of those kids, go love those kids and teach them about Christ and raise them up that way. And they'll go home and tell their families and their families will see the difference that it's made in those kids. And that's what's happening in Ecuador. You know, Lincoln and I had uh, lunch a couple years ago and there happened to be some police officers next to us here locally. And I just asked, how can we make a bigger difference in this community? He said, you've got to reach people before age of 14. He said, after that, it's so difficult to make a difference. So he said, if you're trying to connect with people, get them before age 14. And it's really not just here, but it's down there as well. Just if we're going to change a generation, take in those that have been cast aside. It's, it's a fantastic work. I, I agree. I agree. And I, I just want to, I want to thank this church for the, the, the responsibility they have taken on. And I described the Twickenham mission committee as a place where the buck stops here and what is it so amazing about this committee I, i've been on a committee for years and I, I talk to different churches and stuff and and we we take our job so lightly i mean we take our budget and we send a little here and we send a little there and then wow three years could go by and you could just forget all about the money that you sent somewhere and you just move all over the place and it's no big deal if it, you know you just kind of send your money off different places but this church has taken personal responsibility for what's happening on that mountainside. And, uh, I mean, you have staff and hundreds of kids and, and people that, that rely on you for, uh, for, for life and, and for their salvation. And this committee takes that seriously. And that's, that is so amazing. And that has been such an example to our church and to our, com our committee is to is to be responsible for something and be there for them and make them know that, that uh, you're not going to walk away if times are tough or, or whatever. And, and that's the example that this church has given the church in Decatur. Well, for years, our leadership team has been praying for a sister congregation and others to see this vision and to come alongside. And you guys definitely have been a huge blessing. So take that message back to your committee and your shepherds and the folks in Decatur. So... And thank you so much for taking time to come here on your own dime to come and share the story and share your passion. Let's show our appreciation to David. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I sure appreciate it. And we, uh, 
there in Decatur, we, we love the family here at Twickenham and are, and are so proud to work with y'all. And you guys all have families, different congregations and um, family and friends. And don't quit telling the story of Hacienda of Hope. Because I, I'm telling you, Jason Brooks came and told us the story, and, and just it didn't take 15 minutes for us to get behind it. And there are churches like Decatur Church of Christ all over this country that, that I believe would love to be a part of this work. And you guys are not in it alone. That's what I want you to know. And, um, you know, let's just keep telling that story. Send those, those little note cards about those orphans to everybody you know and, and uh, just help keep raising awareness. And I challenge you all to meet your goal a month from now for that contribution. So... I, uh, I, I know that you will. I know you will. Thank you very much. That's on Sunday, March 3rd. Sunday, March 3rd. Well, th this morning, if you find yourself in one of these two ditches, either that your faith has been a private thing between you and God, but really you've struggled to find your, your place to, to get involved and, uh, and to really make a difference, or you feel like that, that you're giving and serving, but you're not connecting with God. Jesus addressed both of these two ditches in the passage we read earlier today from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 and verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt isn't connected with God and loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. But those of you that are, are connected with God you're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light and put it under a bowl. You've got to get out there and, and share with others what God is doing in your life. Instead, put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. They may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So if we're going to make a difference and we're truly going to serve others, I want to share with you from this passage it talks about that our lives are for the sake of other people. What's the three-step process? Quickly, the three steps, if we're going to make a difference. Number one is to claim your identity. Claim your identity. Jesus talks about it and He says, you are salt. You are light. It, it's not something that we'll hope to... It's just one day because no, you are. Randy Harris in his book, Living Jesus, shares that one of the great things about performing a wedding ceremony is the moment where he gets to announce that you now are husband and wife. He said, you're creating something new. When you enter into that thing, and right before you say it, you're not husband and wife, but when you're proclaimed before the witnesses, they now are. He writes this, once I pronounce him husband and wife, at least the guy is going to spend the rest of his life trying to become what I just told him he was because he knows nothing about being a husband. Because we are united with Christ, we are salt and we are light. May we spend a lifetime being held in that tension that we're already salt and light, but we're also becoming salt and light with ever-increasing glory. Which brings us to number two. Allow God to transform your, your identity. Salt means you're distinctive. Salt means you're, you're standing out. You're set apart for its purposes. Don't allow yourself to get watered down as far as light or someone off the hook because Jesus is the light of the world. We merely reflect His glory. You, you remember the story of, of Moses. He comes into the presence of God and he's spending time with Him. And as he comes back down, he can't help but glow and show the radiance of God. So that's what's going on. How does that work? Well, when I was a, a child, I went to the Five and Dime store and I bought some of those glow-in-the-dark stickers and I didn't know how it worked, but I didn't want all the glowing to, to go out. So I put it into a sleeve that they gave me, a, a paper bag sleeve, and I took it home. And then at night, it's time for me to go to bed. I pulled these out, and right before they turned off the light, I, I stuck them on, on my headboard. And when I turned off the light, nothing was working. And so I went and talked with my father. I said, uh, Dad, the glowing the dark stickers aren't working. And he had his PhD in chemistry, and he said, well, they've been inhibited from experiencing phosphorescence and they haven't been able to absorb the energy in order to glow. And I looked at my mom. She said, you got to put them next to the light bulb. I said, okay, I can do that. So the more I put the light bulb up next to them, the brighter they became. And they didn't, like a glow stick that runs out of energy, these keep going. They keep going, but they eventually start diminishing until I 
put my lamp up against them again, then it start glowing. We've got to allow God to transform us with ever-increasing glory, is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Finally, we need to share our identity. Share our identity. Every year at Christmas, even our kids are getting older, we still sit down to watch the claymation Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. How many of y'all watch that? Uh, one of the most awkward scenes is when he goes to try out to be on Santa's team and he's discovered he's got this red thing so they put some type of cap over his nose and he can't talk and all this. And, and what's he trying to do? He's trying to cover up his identity to conceal it in order that he can play reindeer games. Sometimes we try to play games that the world says is important by covering up our identity, concealing who God's calling us to be it didn't work for Rudolph. It doesn't work for us. We've got to get our light out, take it out from underneath the bowl, put it on the stand to illuminate our part of the kingdom that God has given us to. And really, we have two choices as individuals in a church. We can hunker down and create our own type of biosphere. Or we can get out there. We can make a difference, not from our own strength, but from our time spent with God to demonstrate our love for Him by loving God and loving others deeply. God created us for a purpose, to be salt and to be light. Let's change the world around us. Let's make a difference on, on March 3rd when we take up our collection of what's going on down in Ecuador. But let's also make sure we're being salt and light in this community in the neighborhoods that God has called us to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and illuminate others we come in contact with. Once again, thanks so much for being here. David, thank you for coming very much. And, and I'm sure this is, you'll hate this, but www.nrsworld for really cool cowboy stuff. Trust me, I buy from you guys all the time. Thanks. Uh, and good to have all of you. Thanks so much for being with us. If you're a guest, a special welcome. Um, as we close, a couple of announcements that I need to make you aware of. There's a baby shower today honoring John and Brandy Ashmore. That's from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. They're registered at Babies R.S. and Target. Men's Retreat, guys. Men's Retreat is this coming Friday and Saturday. If you're not signed up, it's not too late. We can still get you in. We have some extra spots. You can check with one of the staff or with Tom McKee or with Dave Morrell. And uh, we can still get you in. Just let us know today or tomorrow if you'd like to go. Information about that in the bulletin. Easter Chorus. Um, if you are a great singer, Easter Chorus is at 1 o'clock today down the hall. If you are an average singer, Easter Chorus is today at 1 o'clock down at the end of the hallway. If you think maybe you can sing but aren't sure, Easter Chorus is today down the hallway at 1 o'clock. If you can't sing at all and would come like to mouth the words, Easter Chorus is today at 1 o'clock. Please come and join us. Lastly, one of the most exciting announcements that I have ever made from the stage of this beloved sanctuary, and I've had the privilege to make many, many exciting announcements. Um, when I came to this church in May of 1992, uh, we had several hundred thousand dollars worth of building debt that had been left over from when the church was originated in 1979. If you were here when this church started, one of the oldies, regardless of your age, would you stand please? We thank you for the vision that you had. Thank you. We thank you for the vision that you had to start a new community of God's believers that has become what it has today. We thank you for that vision. Several years later, about 1996, we were reaching the end of that debt, but we decided to go into a building program in which we added the gymnasium and this entire classroom wing about $2.2 million worth of facilities that we built at that time. Would you stand if you were here in 96 when we did all of that work? There's another group. So you get a sense of, of who's been here for a really long time. Now, originally they went through a bond deal and they raised money, all that kind of stuff. In 96, we decided just to finance the $2.2 million. We've been paying for it ever since, uh, to the point that it recently reached 
And I know, because I have refinanced this note, I counted up at least nine times in the last 20 years. We reached $700,000 left in that debt, just under it recently. And um, this morning, I asked a friend of mine to come because this was going to pay off. Thomas, come on up here. This is Thomas Buddy. He's one of the vice presidents at National Bank of Commerce, uh, where we currently, our debt resides. And uh, it would have paid off in three years from today, but you brought something with you. What is this? I've got loan documents for the debt associated with, the, uh, with this campus. From all the way back in 1996. And you brought that today because... Well, I think the uh, Twickenham's ability to help in Ecuador and other places is about to increase exponentially because on Monday, this note paid off. My heart is warm. <laughs> and in a situation like this, what would you suggest that we do with this note? I don't know, why don't we tear it up? That'd be great. <laughs> Wanna help? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thomas, his wife Brooke, and kids are members at Mayfair, and they graciously came over to be with us this morning. I appreciate that. Uh, we were able to pay the entire debt off. The church is debt-free. Uh, Financial Peace University makes a lot more sense for the church now, right? Um, and obviously the future is that we're, we're going to be able to do a whole lot more for Ecuador and the community and outreach and evangelism and all those kinds of things. And it's such a great blessing. We were able to do this through some large contributions that came in at the end of the year with some other cash reserves that we had. We will take the money that would normally go to the building to replenish some of those for the remainder of the year that we burn. Um, so that we could get to this point. And then beginning in 2014, we'll get to take a real look at the vision and what we are able to, through God's blessing, to do for the kingdom in the future. And so I hope that we can all say amen. Lastly, if you have a need this morning, our shepherds will be available right through these doors to my right as we dismiss after this closing song and prayer. Let's stand as we sing and then we are dismissed.